So, all right. So it says that we are live on YouTube. Welcome, YouTube. Today's Clear Vision uh, Wednesday is all about astigmatism. And I call this From Scatter to Clear Focus. And I have a little slideshow uh, for you. And if you have any questions, I won't see the, the chat or the comments during the live YouTube streaming. But if you have any questions, like simply put them in the comments underneath the video, and then I will respond to them afterwards. So if you, if there's anything that you don't quite understand yet, or you just, you know, because astigmatism is one of those more complex topics. And uh, that's why I love just also like to avoid talking about it. So let me share my screen and um, I, we will get going. All right, so you should see my screen. And if one of my, I'm gonna play this. And if one of my team members, if you don't see the screen, let me know if everything is good, then we don't have to say anything. All right, so, oops, let me just put this in. Screen show, here we go. Nope, I jumped ahead. Okay, so first of all, medical disclaimer, this is definitely important. I don't do this on every single Clear Vision Wednesday, but I wanna make sure that what I'm teaching, that you understand it doesn't, you know, it doesn't replace traditional vision care or going, having an eye doctor check out your eyes. So I'm an educator, not a medical doctor. I'm not prescribing you or diagnosing you for anything, but this is basically an educational little video that we're doing here. So here's the thing, astigmatism changes rapidly because it's connected to our mental and emotional states, not just the physical body, which that's pretty much all the eye doctors talk about. And I like to say that it changes like the weather in April. And I do love this image of the double rainbow because it really connect, looks like the cornea, right? The outer and the inner edge of the cornea with the two rainbows, right? It kind of, I like that, that image a lot. And it also has the light and the different colors and the, you know, how the light responds the light that looks white to us, how it actually produces colors. So astigmatism is super common and the American uh, Academy of Ophthalmology act estimates that about 35% of Americans have it, but it's probably a lot higher because a mild astigmatism, anything under one diopter, and we, we look at to where you see that in your prescription, is usually not even noticeable. And most people, right, don't go to the eye doctor if they don't have a vision problem. So, here, basically, this is a very simple graphic that you can think of in terms of the physical aspect of astigmatism. Most astigmatism happens in the cornea. There's a few that in the lens, but that's kind of, that's called lenticular astigmatism. So a normal cornea looks like a dome shape. It looks like, like, think of a basketball. You basically have that kind of, all the curves are the same. There's no like different angles. But an astigmatic cornea looks more like an American football. You know, you see that little overlay here where there's a steeper, and a flatter aspect of your cornea. So it looks different. That's basically how you can think of it in really simplistic terms. And here's an image that demonstrates a little bit when you look at to that eye, you know, the left one is like circular, right? It's completely round. And then the right one looks like an oval, like kind of that American football when you look at that. And that creates a kind of a blurry image or duplication or a tripled or doubled image like you can see on that letter A right here. So this is another simple image. When we have normal vision, right? The cornea and the lens bend the light and it falls into the retina, into the fovea, creating a clear image. With astigmatism, because of these different angles of your cornea, you have different focal points in your retina, creating that kind of blurry image, even with one eye, right? If you have a double image with two eyes, there could be a fusion problems. But if you have it with one eye, that could be a very clear indication of astigmatism. So, and this can cause images to be blurry, to be stretched out, like I said, doubled or multiplied or otherwise distorted. And here's the thing, it can affect only the near distance or only the far distance, or it could happen at different distances or all of them. And you can only have astigmatism in one eye or you can have it in both eyes. And it's very commonly appears in combination with nearsightedness and farsightedness. So I've rarely seen anybody that just had astigmatism and nothing else. So other signs of astigmatism or symptoms can include um, this, like we talked about the distorted, distorted lines, double vision with one eye open, headaches, migraines, eye strain, and, and blurry vision at all or certain distances. So here's the thing, most, this is again, I'm talking about the most common forms of astigmatism is basically, it affects only certain angles, right? So when you look at this kind of star chart, 
there's always an area that's black looking and then there's other lines that look blurry, gray, doubled or tripled, right? So if you are only far side or near side and you would look at this at a distance where you have blur, all the lines would look equally blurry, but there wouldn't be one that's blacker and one that's more blurry. Hope that makes sense so far. And this is basically the, the typical astigmatism test, right? It has all these different angles outlined, right? The, the horizontal one is 0, 180, and then the vertical one is 90. And it basically tells you the exact axis in each eye where your astigmatism is located. And we will look at prescriptions in a moment. But that's the, the, the line of your astigmatism or the axis in your prescription is where your vision is the blurriest, right? So think of that American football again. The curve where your, your cornea is too flat, that's why you have that blurry vision. That's why you have that astigmatic axis in your prescription. So um, here is, again, um, so when you think of your, your American football, again, the steepest axis is usually where you, have, where you have the perfect vision. In other words, when you look at this left star here, right, this, the blackest line is horizontally, right? You see that blackest line horizontally. So that is the steepest curve of that kind of football shaped cornea. And then the flattest one is here in this case, the 90 degree that where it's really blurry. And on the right image, it's the opposite way. The, the steepest one is that kind of 90 degree vertical axis and the blurriest or the flattest curve of the cornea is the 180 zero kind of horizontal line. So I know that this anatomical stuff is pretty heady and that's again why most eye doctors don't like to talk about astigmatism because it's a little bit more complex than just far or nearsightedness. So basically there are three different types of astigmatism and I'm not talking about the lens, again, I'm just focusing on the one in the cornea, which is not, and the one I'm talking about, the three types are not related to the axis, but they're related to the strength of your astigmatism, which is shown on the cylinder or in the cylinder column of your prescription, and it's measured in diopters. So a simple astigmatism, right, which you kind of see here on the left. One focal point falls correctly on the retina. Again, that's where the steepest curve of your cornea is. And the other one on the flattest curve, and it falls either behind the retina, in which case you're far-sighted, or it falls in front of the retina, in which case you're nearsighted. Right? The graphic here on the left shows an example of a simple nearsighted astigmatism with one focal point on the retina. Technically, it's a little behind it, but just assume that left blue dot is kind of on the retina, and the other one falls in front of it, making this a nearsighted astigmatism. On the right image, right, how, see how all the focal points fall in front of the retina. So that's called a compound astigmatism, meaning that both or even more than two focal points fall all behind or in front of the retina, which makes your near or farsightedness more intense, right? Worse, may, meaning it compounds your farsightedness and nearsighted. And we will look at that in a prescription in the next slide. And um, there's also a mixed astigmatism, and I don't have an image for that here, but where one focal point falls in front of the retina and one falls behind it. And that's kind of a mixed one where one is near sight and one is far sighted. So here's an example of a prescription. And in this case, see the sphere, this person is near sighted, minus nine diopters, and the cylinder is a minus four. So this is a compound astigmatism, meaning the cylinder, right? The astigmatism worsens the nearsightedness that this person has. Let's assume the cylinder would have a plus four in this example, right? Let's say that would be a plus, which would be a far-sighted astigmatism. So that would make the nearsightedness of the person less intense. I know it's a little confusing, but this is when I teach my students to get reduced glasses. We always want to take the astigmatism out because the correction in the glasses lock it into place. There's no room for the eyes to change. And the way you take it out is by adding half of the cylinder to the sphere. So in this case, let's, let's assume this again, this is the prescription that's minus nine, minus four. I'm looking at the right eye, the first row. So half of the minus four is minus two. And if you add that to the sphere, the two, what I call clean diopters, the true prescription of this person, if you would take the astigmatism out and simply add it to the sphere would be a minus 11. Right? So this is a lot of times people are like, oh, I'm in the minus nine, but they ignore the cylinder. So this is truly a minus 11. But let's assume that uh, the person that would be a plus four, right? That the cylinder would be a plus four, not a minus. Half of my, a plus four is a plus two. 
And if you add that to minus nine, it makes it a minus seven, reducing the nearsightedness that, that, that this person has. So again, if this is a lot of information, then just, you know, you can review this again. You can comment under the video. If it, it's a lot, it's sim basically simple math, really. So here's the thing, traditional treatments of astigmatism is right, we all know this, glasses, contacts, LASIK or lens implants that can happen with cataract surgery. And basically the problem with these traditional treatments is that they, you know, they, they're called corrections, right? But they don't really correct anything, but they lock your astigmatism in place and there's no way for your cornea to change shape, which is, you know, the cornea is a piece of the, part of the eyeball and it's not like a structure made out of glass and steel. It's really soft, right? The eyeball is very soft. So the cornea can easily shape, uh, change its shape. So just one last thing about the corrections and the glasses here. So basically this is, I think this is helpful to understand. So if you are nearsighted, right? Your focal point, you see that on the very top left, your focal point falls in front of the retina. And the glass, the correction of the, the glasses that they give you are called concave, right? So they make, they bring the focal point onto the retina and they kind of make everything look smaller, right? And so myopic lenses always have a minus in front. If you have a minus in front of your sphere or your astigmatism, that means nearsightedness. And then the middle, you see a far-sighted person, right? In the top middle image. So the focal point falls behind the retina Right? And the glass that you get are basically these con, um, convex. They are kind of magnifying glasses, bringing the focal point to the retina, and they make everything look bigger. And on the very right, see how that kind of, I like that little guy, how it's kind of flipped a little crooked on the, on the retina there, right? So one focal point, let's say the feet of the person is kind of, uh, you know, in front of the retina and the, and the top is on the retina, creating that kind of tilted, distorted angle. I mean, this is an oversimplified version, but I think it helps to understand the point. And you see how the lens, this person is nearsighted because again, the focal point is in front of the retina. So it's a con uh, cave lens, but see how it has different thicknesses. So that's what the cylinder does to your glasses. It creates a different a, a cylinder in the glasses. It's quite complicated to understand, but all you need to know is that it has different strength in different parts of the glasses. So here are some common causes of astigmatism. It could be definitely from corneal diseases or injuries, sometimes from heart contacts or other injuries to the cornea. If you have very dry eyes, that can also be a leading, you know, kind of create a corneal injury. Um, it could also be extraocular muscle tension, and we will talk about that. So one of the six eye muscles or more than one is overly tense, pushing the eyeball out of shape, which also affects the shape of the cornea. It could even be excessive eyelid tension. So if you have like eyelids and you kind of, they, they're very tense, right? They're, they're laying right on top. Your eyelids are right on top of the retina, uh, sorry, cornea. So if they're overly tense, they can definitely create or change the shape of the cornea. And then it's also related to head posture and eye movements. And we will go into these things in a little more detail in a moment. Also like from a mental aspect, kind of a multitasking, ADD, kind of trying to have too many balls in the air at, the, at all times. And lastly, from an emotional perspective, it's a kind of an uncertainty of your own wants and feelings. So let's look at the physical things first. So with dry eye syndrome, what I recommend is palming, blinking, cold and warm compresses can be really helpful. Omega-3 fatty acids are important, lots of water and no caffeine because caffeine dehydrates you. So you definitely want to use these techniques to keep your dry eye. And here's the thing with these fake artificial tears, they actually make your eyes produce even less um, tears. So that's not what I recommend. But if you do take those drops, slowly wean yourself off. Don't just stop from one day to the next, like slowly reduce them. And if they're prescription eye drops, eye drops, definitely talk to your doctor. And then when it comes to the excessive tension, right? You see a, a picture here of the, uh, you see four of the eye muscles here out of the six. But basically, if they have, if they are very tense, they will, right, shape your eyeball could be longer or shorter, and that will also affect the, the shape of the cornea. So, you know, you might have heard of these yogic eye circles. They're not a big part of what I teach, but they can be really helpful when you move your eyes, you keep your head still, 
and you move your eyes in those circles, you've probably all seen them or heard of them. And that's what most people think that, you know, vision improvement is doing these eye circles. I don't really use them as a, as a kind of a remedy, but they are helpful to kind of get a sense of where are my eye muscles tight, right? Where are you looking? If you look to the side, is anything painful or restrictive? And so I do think these can be helpful to kind of release some tension, but I would not overdo this maybe once a day, maybe twice a day, and you do two circles in each direction, like no more than that. And once you don't feel any tension or strain in any direction, then stop that. You know, those I would not recommend continue those. But it's a great tool to diagnose and feel like, where are my muscles tight? So here's a little video. I think I hopefully I, this works. Let me see. And I kind of demonstrate how excessive muscle tension on the eyeball can shape its size. This or this way. This is just a cheap little toy eyeball, but it shows how the shape of the cornea is affected depending on which muscles pull on the eyeball. I cannot demonstrate this in detail without expensive animations, but I hope you understand the concept. All right, I think it's really clear, right? When some of these muscles are super tight, that the cornea, it's part of the eyeball, so it will definitely, and it's not made of glass. So let's get into some more remedies. Um, something I found really helpful with my students is with astigmatism, remember that some of the lines, assuming that you're not very far or nearsighted, but let's say you are a little bit, um, a little bit farsighted maybe, but you kind of see the difference when you look at a mandala, like the one I'm drawing here, that some of the lines look black and other, other angles look really blurry. So using some coloring and relaxing into that blinking and breathing. And usually what happens when you relax, the, you, you, the shadow kind of the doubling image can disappear. So that is a really, if you like coloring, right? If you like those kind of things that could be very helpful practice, kind of a meditative relaxation practice, um, you know, and being aware of the astigmatism, but ignoring that shadow, just really focusing on the line that looks the blackest. Um, and again, for the excessive eyelid tension, if you have that, definitely palming, blinking, warm compresses can help. And I also like to rest like three, my three middle fingers, like, you know, ring finger, middle finger, index finger, really gently on your eyelid, close your eyes, and then really gently let them rest there. And just like the weight of the fingers, you're not pressing on your eyeball, please, but just kind of a very gentle, letting the weight of your fingers rest on the eyeball can really help release some tension. And then also any acupressure points around the eyes. I'm not showing all the different points, but you can use acupressure around the eyes and also caffeine, I would limit that as well. So now let's get into the posture and really the, the, the research was done by optometrist Elliot Forrest in the 1980s, and he said, the major implication is that even though there may be physical and physiological causes for some type of astigmatism, the vast majority of those with astigmatism appear to have a functional variety that is caused and altered by how the eyes are used in the ongoing interaction between the individual and his or her environment. He also said, a reduction of astigmatism is feasible at any age in within reasonable periods of time, regardless of the corrective prescription that is worn by the individual. And he did studies with thousands of his patients, meticulously you know, writing down any change in habit or job or anything that they did with their eyes and their head and their movements. So he took meticulous notes and found an 85% correlation between you know, the strength of the astigmatism and the axis. And this is an image, uh, the images are copyrighted by him. But basically, this is just a simple example here that when you habitually, let's say you're right-handed and you habitually glance over to the right side without moving your head and just moving your eyes, the left eye you can see here is further away from the focal point, creating an astigmatism in that eye that's further away, right? And you see that in the right image, it's the other way around that the person um, tilts, she tilts her head, which, you know, who doesn't sometimes tilts the head or rotates the head in some way. So you definitely want to always move your attention with your head. And Norwegian researchers have replicated this studying orchestra musicians. And they found like some musicians like violinists, like shown here, who always have their head tilted, but the music stand, the notes, the way their eyes are moving is horizontal, right? Like the music is not placed at the same angle. And they all develop an astigmatism in that axis that's related to the, to the tilt of the head 
but the eyes are not scanning the music right in that same angle, they're scanning it on a horizontal level. And for my students and my programs, I have like a detailed little chart that shows the typical axis of astigmatism and what that means for your head posture and your eye scanning movements. But basically what you wanna think about is moving your attention you know, I don't want you to think of just moving the eyes or just moving the head, but if you consistently habitually move the eyes in one way without moving your head all the time, right? Let's say the, the one here is shown on the, on the second row, right? If you have readers, for instance, and you always have them at the bottom of your nose and then you look up and you always just move your eyes up so you don't want to look through the readers when you look in the distance, you will get that typical 90 degree axis of astigmatism. So there's a very 85% correlation between your posture, your eye scanning and your head posture. So I talk about this a little bit. So there's also kind of that mental multifocusing kind of tendency. And I, I do tend to get astigmatism sometimes in my right eye, um, you know, where you feel like you have all these balls in the air. So you, you literally have so many different focal points. And when you study, if you study vision improvement a little bit or anatomy of the eyes, you know that the phobia is the only place where you have clarity. So you can really only clearly focus on one thing and then the other objects are in your peripheral awareness, but you cannot focus on more than one thing at a time. So that's when it comes to the mental aspect, you know, make a clear list of what is the priority for this day. You know, maybe two other things that are less in your peripheral that you want to get done, but don't do these to-do lists, you know, for every day or every hour where you have like 10 things, like really, Focus on your top priority, either for the day or the week, whatever works for you and break project plans or projects into little bite-sized pieces and then focus on one at a time. So this could be a whole lecture in itself, right? How we, how we do our work or how we mentally focus. And then let's talk, finish with the emotional aspect. So Louise Hay said astigmatism means eye trouble. We are really seeing the self. And Martin Brothman, who wrote several books about vision improvement, he did a lot of research. He passed away uh, a while ago, but he basically defined connections between certain personality types and vision conditions. And he found that people with astigmatism experience an uncertainty of wants or feeling, depending on whether both eyes were affected or if it was just the right or the left with astigmatism. So the right eye and the right-handed person if, you, if you're left-handed, it's the left eye, but just let's, for simplicity reasons. So your right hand and the right eye represents the will. It means seeing very clearly what you want and the left one seeing clearly what you feel. And for me, for me, myself as an example, I tended to have a astigmatism on the right side and it's, I can feel that flare up when I don't know what I want. When I'm like in that kind of wishy-washy, like, I don't know what, and people ask me, what do you want? I'm like, I don't know. I know all the things I don't want. And um, again, if you're left-handed, that's the other way around. So right-handed person, right eye is will, knowing what you want, left is connected to what you feel, right? And he says that, that, that an astigmatic person wants or feels their own truth, but for some reason considers it inappropriate and then forces herself or himself into different beliefs. And this is often coming, you know, like most of the things that bother us nowadays, coming from childhood when our behaviors were either invalidated or for some other reasons, we didn't feel like it was the right thing to do, say, or, you know, um, say or do or whatever, you know, I can't think of another word, but we felt like we weren't, you know, what we did, we had to, we feel we had it to kind of behave differently than we really would have behaved just to kind of fit in and um, be like everybody else. And I definitely had that in childhood. Um, you know, and who hasn't, right? I mean, there's definitely that connection that we feel like, okay, I'm awkward. Like, let me try to be more than somebody else that's popular. And eventually the person with astigmatism believes that this pretended state is the real one, losing sight of their own true wants, needs, and desires. And this is often by using, if you use the word should a lot, I should, I should, I should. That's like a typical, what Brothman found is a typical expression of this kind of not being in this true state. And I definitely catch myself saying that word as well. So, and that basically, you know, when you're like in this pretended state, like an actor, right? You're pretending to be this person that you're not really deep down, there's a confusion. And that also shows up in not being sure about your own choices or again, what you want or feel. 
and often asking others for advice. And there's nothing wrong with asking others for advice, especially if there's experts, right? You know, you want to ask your eye doctor about some of the things that with your eyes, but there's also like, you know, trusting yourself versus just um, believing or trusting what everybody else tells you to do. So um, we're almost done. But I think for the emotional aspect here, what I recommend is to journal and to really ask yourself, what do I really want? What do I really feel? What's who for me? If I stop wanting to be someone else, who would I be? And if I stop living to other people's standards, who would I be? If I stop being an actor in my own life, what would I do differently? Um, so definitely journaling is a great way to do this because it might not, you might sit there and be like, nothing comes up, but maybe if you kind of, you know, kind of have that thought or that, you know, question floating around your head, sometimes at the most, you know, unexpected moments, something comes up for you. And you might also feel that you wouldn't, here's the thing too, right? Once you become your true self and you, you show more than you, who you really are, some people in your environment, you know, family members or friends might not accept you, right? They might not like being this new person, right? But um, the only way to find out, and you know, you can worry about that or you can just do it and find out and uh, by pretending to be somebody else and be your true self. And if your environment doesn't turn out to be supportive, here's the thing, you could look for a new community or you can look for new friends because at the end of the day, what is it worth bending yourself over into a shape that you're not? And um, I'm gonna finish here with this. So mentally, you know, astigmatism can show up and I've definitely experienced these things. Again, jumping from task to task without finishing anything, not able to concentrate, racing thoughts, unfinished sentences, feeling overwhelmed, anxiety, and also not living in the now. And one something I love to use um, for myself and also for my students, I usually use it with my private students is Dark flower remedies, you might have heard of those. Um, they were developed by an English doctor, homeopath and bacteriologist, Dr. Edward Buck. And he was a contemporary of Dr. Bates actually. And he developed these 38 flower remedies that help restore out of balance mental states and feelings. And he found that when he treated the personalities and feelings of his patients, the unhappiness and physical distress or whatever that weird off balance energy was, would be alleviated naturally as the healing potential in their bodies was unblocked and allowed to work. So um, the ones that I like to use, and again, this is not, I don't want you to take all of these things I'm gonna show you in a moment, but there's, I found these to be reflective or kind of connected to some of these astigmatic um, mental behaviors that we talked about. And um, do your own research, right? I'll talk to a um, certified flower practitioner um, and depending on what it is, right? So impatience is really related to like, if you're always impatient, if you're like, if you want to like, you get annoyed by everybody being slow and you want to do things quickly. Elm is about overwhelm and walnut is about, you know, this kind of like transitionary period where you feel like you can't trust your own gut. You always have to ask other people, other people sway you off. You think one thing and then somebody else, oh no, no, you should do it this way. And then you're suddenly, suddenly not certain anymore. Um, chestnut bud, now I get confused. Uh, chestnut bud is a little bit about um, um, repeating. I think it's a repeating the same mistake, not learning from what you've learned. Like, you know, even though you've learned something, you continuously do the same thing or show up with the same behavior. Clematis is really about daydreaming, not being able to focus, always being distracted. And sclerantis is also, it's related to like having two choices and, you know, think of the two focal points, having two choices and you vacillate between them and you cannot make a decision. So, Again, you know, do your research. You can find all this information online. There's no danger in taking back flower remedies. That's what I like them. Um, and maybe, you know, when you read the description, you will be like, oh yeah, that's totally me. Um, so you can take up to seven different ones at the same time, but it doesn't mean that everybody with astigmatism should take all six of these because maybe only two or three apply to you. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, let me finish this. And... Um, I will stop my screen share. And then for YouTube, I have to say goodbye now, but I will look at all your comments afterwards and I will reply to all your questions and comments afterwards. And I hope you got a little bit of a good glimpse into astigmatism and all the different aspects that, uh, you know, your eye doctor def definitely doesn't talk about because they look at purely the physical aspect. And, you know, let me know if your eye doctor actually educated you about astigmatism because 
most of them don't explain at all what this is, right? And they pretend it's this fixed thing as if you are cornea or your lens is made out of glass and it doesn't have any, it's, it's more like actual jello, right? When you think about it, how soft it is. All right, you guys on YouTube, I see you next week. And next week, we're gonna talk about uh, simple things you can do every day that don't take more than a couple of minutes.